Mathematics is full of surprises, so let me show you a surprising thing about this Menger sponge. First, we should define the Menger sponge. You can start with the cube and divide it into 27 smaller cubes, like a Rubik's cube, and remove the six that are in the center of faces and the one in the very center, so 20 small cubes are left. Now do the same operation on the 20 smaller cubes, and then again on their subcubes, etc. The complexity grows exponentially with the number of steps, so any image is just an approximation. In the limit, as you do this infinitely many times, there is zero volume remaining, but infinite area. It's all surface. I've made some Menger sponge models by 3D printing. The finest one I can make is level four. There are four sizes of holes here, and the smallest ones are right at the limit of what my 3D printer could make. Now the surprising thing I want to show you has to do with slicing the Menger sponge. First, let's look at some slices that are not too surprising. If you slice the Menger sponge with the cutting plane parallel to a face, you see a cross section that has solid areas and holes that are either squares or combinations of squares. The exact pattern depends on how much you slice off. It's interesting to see the different cross sections here, depending on where you put the slicing plane. The very last slice, right at the surface of the sponge, is a two-dimensional analog to the sponge called the Sierpinski carpet. Now, as the second example, if you slice the Menger sponge with the plane parallel to an edge, you see holes in the cross section that are rectangles or combinations of rectangles. These cross sections are more interesting, but there's still nothing really surprising yet. But now, what if we slice it in half with the plane perpendicular to the long diagonal of the cube? Again, we can cut off different amounts, but the most interesting case is, what will the cross section be if we cut it exactly in half this way? As a warm up, what if we slice an ordinary cube this way, one without holes? A shallow cut touches three faces, so it gives a triangular cross section. But deeper slices touch all six faces and give hexagonal cross sections. Most of the slices are hexagons with alternating long and short sides, but the long ones shorten and the short ones lengthen, and you see the halfway cut is a regular hexagon. For fun, try taking a cube of potato or cheese and make this diagonal cut with a hexagon cross section. Now, back to the Menger sponge. Here's one that I sliced. The outside of the cross section is a regular hexagon we know. And you can see there'll be holes in it because the tunnels in the Menger sponge pass right through. But what shape are the holes in the hexagon? And how are the holes arranged? Can you predict? The answer is very surprising, so you should pause this video and make a firm guess on paper. What is the shape and pattern of the holes in the hexagon? Really, hit pause now and draw what you think this cross section looks like. Okay, you're back. I have a physical model here which shows the answer. Let's open it up and see. Wow, check that out. There's a pattern of stars hexagonally arranged. This is the kind of surprise that makes mathematics always fresh and interesting. I've shown this model to hundreds of people and only a few have written down this pattern before seeing it. All the slices at different depths are interesting. You can see the triangles and stars morphing into each other. Can you spot the halfway slice? I'll pause it there for a second. The slices generally have three-fold symmetry, but the very center slice has six-fold symmetry. That slice passes through the midpoints of six of the original edges. So what's surprising is how it turns out that we start with a cube with square tunnels and right angles everywhere, and yet we end up with six-pointed stars and six-fold symmetry. The Menger sponge was first described by Carl Menger in 1926, but the first person to think of slicing it on the diagonal, as far as I know, was Sebastian Perez Duarte in 2007. To fully understand it, let's start with a simpler form, the first level approximation to the Menger sponge with only the largest size tunnels. When we vary the cutting plane, you can see the changing cross section, always with threefold symmetry. At the halfway point, you can see the large star-shaped hole in the center with six-fold symmetry. So if we can understand this case, then the many other smaller stars we saw have the same explanation, just based on smaller holes. Now, to clarify where the stars come from, think inversely. Think of the shape of the hole. 
The hole is made of three square tunnels, one along each of the x, y, and z directions. Consider them individually. If you take a square bar along the x direction, slicing it at this angle gives a rhombus for the cross section of the bar. So if you slice a cube that has just one square tunnel, the cross section will have a rhombus shaped hole. Then we cut the y bar with the same plane, so it also gives a rhombus in that plane, but pointing differently. And the z-axis is similar, giving a third hole. Each of the three square bars in the xyz directions has a rhombic cross section in this cutting plane. Combined, we get the three rhombi superimposed, and that forms a star. The holes are the inverse of these bars, but have the same star-shaped boundary. So what looks at first like a pattern of stars is better understood as the combination of overlapping rhombi. Pretty neat. Mathematics often gives us new ways to see things.